heart. I open my heart. And I open my mind. And I open my mind. To everything you have for me. To everything you have for me. Come and teach me, Lord. Come and teach me, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, this, this, uh, I'm going to talk about humility today. Humility is, um, one of my favorite topics. I've talked about it before and I'm going to keep talking about it, I think. Um, and you know, God, God, um, in whatever, whatever vein it is, he takes you deeper and deeper, right? As, as deep as you want to go. Um, humility is one of those things that I, I, I think is worth going Deeper and deeper and deeper. Deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Anybody? Reference? Maybe? No. Office space. Remember the, the guy that, the guy that um, hypnotizes them? He ends up uh, falling over. <laughs> really funny part, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> deeper and deeper. Deep, anytime I say deeper and deeper, I think of that. Um, okay. So, so here, so good news right out the gate. Uh, well, bad news, it's really hard to be humble, right? <laughs> Super hard. Um, it's like contrary to the human nature to be humble, you know? You just, what, what's very natural is to be prideful and to be self-reliant and self-righteous and um, self-defensive, all that stuff. It's really easy to live that way, but it's, it's really hard to be humble. Um, but it doesn't need to be. That's the catch. Um, Jesus lived the, the ultimate paradox life. Right? He had everything to be proud of. He had every every reason to be the most prideful man who ever lived. Um, yet he walked as the most humble man that ever lived, and he chose constantly to be humble. And um, his it, it's such an empowering thing when you realize humility is a choice. And you've been empowered to be humble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a choice every single day, every single time. Like in all your situations that you have come to you, humility is a choice. And it's super powerful to choose humility. It's Godlike. You reveal God's goodness, his glory, his manifest presence when you choose humility in your life. That's good. You reveal mere human when you choose pride when you choose self-righteousness, when you choose self-protection, self-proclamation, whatever that is, you know? Like, that's, that's just man. Um, but Christ in you is choosing humility. And um, the, in a, one of my favorite passages that I, I refer to often is Philippians 2. Um, and uh, in, in the ESV, I love it because um, that's the only version I can find it saying it this way. It says, have this mind among yourselves. This is verse 5. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It, it's so clear that it's a gift. You know, yeah. the, the gift of the humble mind is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not something to strive for yeah. unless you're striving to enter the rest. Which, right? It's this, this faith, rest, walk where you enter into... Well, okay, wait, I can't earn humility. I can't earn this mindset. You know, no, you, you awaken to it. You, you go, ah, aha, this is like me now. This is like the new you now. The, the new you is like humility. Yeah. The old familiar feelings of pride and self-righteousness and self-defense is not like you anymore. That's like the old man that's been crucified. And, it, and that guy stinks. He's a, he's a corpse. She's a corpse. Like that thing ought to be a stench in your nose. And then the discerner of, that you've been given as a gift, that, that discernment that God's given you when, you, when you smell that, it should smell like death to you. Pride and, and self-righteousness and self-defense. Um, but it's so familiar and it's so common that we don't often discern that um, before we're walking in it. And then it takes people around us to point us back in the right direction. You stink. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to pat on my face. Um, so, so have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God or didn't consider it something to be held on to, right, or taken advantage of. He, he didn't say, hey, I'm God, so you guys all shut up and do what I want you to do. Um, he, he emptied himself. One of the most cool theological uh, words in the Bible is that word right there in Philippians 2. It's kenosis, um, kinu or whatever. And it means empty, to empty yourself completely of your rights, of what you think you deserve, of uh, what you do deserve. I mean, Jesus deserved everything. Yet he emptied himself of what he deserved yeah. as God, yeah. which is so powerful, you know? And, and, uh, and again, I'll keep reminding you, the, the choice. He emptied himself. Yeah. The father didn't say, son, you will empty yourself, you know? Like he, he chose to empty himself. It was the father's will for him to do that because that's God's heart. He's just like that. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the father, yeah. Um, but he emptied himself. He humbled himself. He became a man. He chose all these things. Uh, so amazing. So he humbled himself to the point of death, right? Uh, death on the cross. So, so he, he lives the life and he constantly chooses humility. Uh, it's so um, mind bending. To the, to the carnal mind to think through like the implications of how Jesus constantly chose humility, um, why he didn't defend himself, why he didn't argue in certain ways, why he answered certain people in certain ways, you know, why he spoke the way he did. It, it was all filled with humility. Um, so the, the basis for today is have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's, that's the basis. The basis is Humility is a gift for you to receive in Christ. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You don't have to go striving for it. The only kind of striving for us is to enter the rest. It's a striving of believing. You, you strive to believe. You don't strive to do, to perform, to make God impressed with you because that's the filthy smelling stuff of the old covenant, right? Um, that reveals your lack. It's the striving to enter into the identification with the Son, with the one who's done everything for you, as you, in your place. Um, so um, I want to tell a little story and why I was inspired to talk about humility again today. Um, uh, Amy and I were talking this morning, and then Megan, and then Nora came in. But um, everyone has different pieces of revelation God gives them, you know, depending on where you're at in life and how you're open and what you're made for what you're drawn to. You know, God is speaking to all of us, and he's giving us all specific revelation on certain things. So Amy has certain revelation um, that I don't have and I don't understand. And I had a dream the other day that brought it up, but it's just something that she talks about a lot, and it's um, the subject of separation versus union, which is a big topic, obviously, right? God's reconciling the world. He's reconciling everyone to and through and in him, um, so it's a big old topic. And... Um, she started talking this morning and uh, about separation, and I realized super quickly that in my mind, I was not following her at all. <laughs> I was lost. And she was talking to me about it so simply, and she just got it. She was just like, yep, separation this, and blah, 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 that, and blah, 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 and, this, and all these profound things. You know what I mean? She's just like, uh, re un unleashing all this profound revelation, and I cannot keep up. I'm like, in my mind, I'm frustrated. I'm like, okay, I can't even follow you right now because I'm trying to understand the simplicity of separation. Like, I can't, like, I, my, it kept slipping out of my mind. Like, I could not apprehend it and understand it. And for, for a couple of years, God has repeatedly emphasized to me, do not separate what God has joined together. He's talked to me about that with marriage. He's talked to me about that with union with Christ. He's talked to me about that with the body, you know, like this... And, and we separate ourselves constantly. And I, I've got limited understanding of this topic. But when she was talking to me, she's, she just has this whole other pool of revelation and understanding when it comes to separation and union. And I, I realized my lack, and it was really frustrating. I was like sitting there trying to listen to her, and I was frustrated because I couldn't understand what she was saying. And uh, at the end of it, when I started sharing, I came back to I was like, man, I couldn't. I, I, I know you have an amazing revelation, but I, 
I don't really follow you because I don't, I, I'm getting stuck on separation. I don't understand. I, I feel like there's so much I don't understand. That's, it just felt like this huge, gray, fuzzy misunderstanding in my mind that I need understanding on. That's how I felt. You know, it's just like, I know I need understanding. And um, from that, from there in the, in the conversation, um, somehow we ended up in um, humility. And I, and I realized, man, one of my life lessons, one of my um, biggest moments of freedom was when, when I was at uh, Bethel Sozo and I got to one of the smallest but most potent lies I'd ever received. And it was something like, it was a fear of not knowing something. It was a fear of being wrong. It was all wrapped up in this little lie of, oh, you don't know, therefore you're condemned. I felt that from a, from a young age. It was a, it was a lie that I had received into my soul that I had re- heard on repeat. That, Bo, if you don't know the answer, you're a failure. You deserve to be condemned, and you are you fill in the blank. I, I received a lot of like uh, accusation on that stream of thought. And when I, I I think I've shared this once or twice before in the past, but when uh, the the sozo cancer was bringing me to this place, it felt so small and insignificant that I didn't want to go there because I thought it was a waste of time. Um, but every time I would ask Jesus, like, what, what are you saying about this topic? Um, he kept asking me, what are you afraid of? And, uh, and it, was, it, was a, it was being afraid of not knowing something, not know, or not knowing the right answer, you know? Um, and he, and he finally took me to the place where he was laughing, you know, and I was offended at first um, because it was really serious to me. You know, I, you, when, you, when you're condemned about something, you feel really serious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, you hold it tight and you, get your, you have your little protections up and you're like, eh, you're not going to touch me. I'm going to protect myself. And you're so feeble, you know, you're like a little baby <laughs> trying to like hoard an ice cream cone or something. I don't know. <laughs> and it's so ridiculous. But Jesus is trying to get in there and like heal you, you know, and you're like, no. And, and he started laughing and then I, 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 my whole mindset of it just started to unravel. And I had all these justifications, you know, to protect myself from the, the accusation and the punishment I thought I deserved for not knowing something well enough or rightly or something. And uh, he led me out of that place just with a simple question. He says, oh, what? What do you do when you don't know something? And I had not thought beyond that question. I had only thought to the place of darkness in my heart where, it, what if I don't know something? Or what if I don't know it rightly? And then all these hypothetical situations would come in and attack me. And I would feel, ter- I would feel you know, like torment over that. Uh, but when I finally answered this question, and I started to see what he was getting at, I started laughing hysterically. And I realized, oh my God, like this is the way of the this is the way of the sun. Like you when I don't know something, I I don't know something, so therefore I can be taught. I can ask you. He, he ended up saying, he's like, who after after he's like, you know, what do you do with that? Who, what do you do when you don't know something? I was like, well, I, I guess I can ask. <laughs> humble myself, you know, I don't have to know everything. Um, he's like, yeah, 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 you can ask. And I guess, guess who knows everything kind of thing. That's, that's exactly where he led me. He's like, guess who knows everything? And I was like, I was like, you do. He's like, yes. He's like, and guess who loves to share everything with you? And I was like, you do. He's like, yes, yes, now you're getting it. And it was this like path, it was this pathway through humility, you know, like, he has so much to share with each one of us. Right. He has yeah. so much to share, but we cannot receive it yes. without humility. The pathway to receive everything he has for us is through humility. Yeah, yeah. It's always the pathway, but, but the deception is constantly pride. Yep. It's constant. There's this constant deception that comes to us. It, sli- it sneaks up behind us, and it smells like us, and it looks like us, and it talks like us, and it deceives us out of humility and the simplicity and the plainness of it and back into these, these lofty places where we, we can't receive these simple, powerful exchanges 
and, and experiences that God wants to have with us. Um, so when we were talking this morning, and I, and I realized I was so frustrated that I couldn't grasp a revelation of separate versus union, I, I was like, ah, oh, I felt God again gifting me with humility. I felt it. I was like, oh my God, this is a gift. Yes. I, am, I am now coming into a place of hunger, seeing that I do not understand. I could feel it and perceive it mm. widely. I do not understand separation the way God wants to give me understanding. And, and because I'm coming into a place of humility where I'm just like, I freaking don't know. And I'm not defending myself, and, and I, I have to let go of the frustration because the only reason the frustration is there is because I want to know. Right. You know, I want to know. I want to get I want to get it before Amy. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Colonel Bo wants. I want to tell people I got it first. <laughs> right? Isn't that what the, the, the flesh man wants? You want it like you want you want credit for your revelations and for your understandings and your your great ideas. Man, there's only one source. Yes. And it all hey, comes man. from him. Yeah. You know? And so if you get something good, we have to learn how to receive it as from him. Yeah. Yeah. And not take credit for what he's giving. You know, because that's another trap. And then we get stuck in this whole, and, and it's so familiar. I've, I, I've fallen a, a million times in this trap. You know, I think I know something, and I want to, I want to tell people that I got it first. You know, I, want, I just want to feel good about it. You know, um, but that's such a trap. Um, because every, what, what do you, you know, Paul, I think Paul, Paul, Peter, I don't know, one of them says, he's like, what do you have that's not being given to you? Yeah. What, you, what, what is it? What can you point to that's not been given to you? As a gift. So how then are you going to boast? Right. As if you somehow deserved what it is that you have that is clearly a good gift from God. You know, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, right? Um, ah, so, this is going to be another short one. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay. Human understanding is led by pride. Yeah, anyways, we just talked about that. Okay. Teachability. Cultivate a heart of teachability. Forever. Uh, there's never going to be a time in eternity future where we're not supposed to be teachable. We're going to be learners forever. God is infinite. And it's going to be awesome. Learning is amazing. Is, is learning not fun? Yeah. yeah. Right? When you get on something that you know you want to understand, unless you're being forced to learn something, right? If you actually apprehend something you're interested in, you want to learn. You, you soak it in like a sponge. Learning is so fun. We're made for it. Okay. Um, God, you know it is so, so, so powerful. Okay, I'm going to go to Philippians 3. If you guys want to see this, um, open up Philippians 3, 7. Um, Paul's talking about his self-righteousness versus um, God's righteousness, and he's talking about humility and pride. And uh, I want to show you something that I saw in recent times that is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen about humility. Um Verse 7, I, let's see, am I reading the Passion or King James? I think this is the Passion version, yeah. Okay. Say again, Philippians what? Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, 1 through 6, he's talking about, hey, I'm in Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, Pharisee of Pharisees, all that stuff. He, he talks about his fleshly accomplishments. Um, but he's like, whatever, all that stuff. He says, yet, yeah, verse 7, all the accomplishments that I once took credit for, I now forsake them and regard them as nothing compared to the delight of experiencing Jesus Christ as my Lord. To truly know him means letting go of everything from my past and throwing all my boasting on the garbage heap. It's all like a pile of manure to me now. It's so good. So that I may be enriched in the reality of knowing Jesus Christ and embrace him as Lord in all of his greatness. My passion is to be consumed with him, not clinging to my own righteousness, which is based on keeping the written law. There's the super clear, the clearest verse in the Bible that talks about 
like righteousness is trying to keep laws. My righteousness will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness that comes from God himself. Uh, that just protects your heart. <laughs> that is the heart protector, that righteousness. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. I will be one with him in his sufferings, and I'll be one with him in his death. This is true humility right there. Paul is talking about the key to resurrection life is humility. Humility looks like death. It looks like letting go of your rights. It looks like letting go of your... Are you good? Yeah, yeah. Um, one, we're going to pray for someone from here. But two, does anybody have Benadryl on them? If so, give it to Megan. Yeah. Praying for whoever needs Benadryl to be completely healed and not have an allergic reaction at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yes. Jesus, someone with the wedding. Yeah, someone with the wedding. Yeah. Um, Holy Spirit, you quicken to life. We release you right now. We release a, a de inflammation yeah. um, to this person's body. We speak peace over their body. Shalom, shalom. All right. So, um, Paul's, Paul's like, I want to know Jesus more than anything. It's my passion, you know. And then he says, This is how I'm. I'm this is how I'm doing. I I want. I, I will be one with him in his sufferings and one with him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of death. Humility is the gateway for life. It's the gateway for resurrection life. Humility is letting go of that self-man struggle that tries to defend itself and give reason for why it should stay alive. The self-man is always justifying every single second of every single day why it should stay alive. It says, I deserve this. I deserve that. I'm entitled to this. Me, me, me. I, I need to exist. I must exist, right? And when this thing is threatened, it feels scared, terrified, and like it's dying mm -hmm. because it needs to die. <laughs> and sometimes it's so wrapped up in the person and it's unseparated from the new that people feel like they're dying. And it's, it's a real feeling. When you come into these places of humility, what you're doing is you're facing death, you know? And you, you are being invited to step into the death of Christ where you find, you identify with his sufferings. You let go of your rights for the for the sake of somebody else. You know? You let go of your reputation for the sake of somebody else. You, you, you start releasing your entitlements, deserved or not, because this is who you are now. Because you're like him. Because he's in you. This is your new nature. This is your character. This is your ethos. This is the spirit of who you are is to let these things go and not insist on your own way. Um, okay, but then Paul says, I admit I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance. That is an awesome little phrase. <laughs> so that I may reach the purpose Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. He wants you to discover your purpose. He wants you to fulfill it by running into his abundance. Because he's so overflowing with grace to give you in your humility. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past. That's a tall order for some of us. Forgetting all of the past. All the, and the ways that your past has defined you, right? Because that's what the world does. The world looks at your past and diagnoses you. Yeah. And any way that you agree with that, you do the same thing. And your voice is stronger than the rest of the voices out there. So forget your past. 
Learn from your past, but forget. Right? Holy Spirit, help us. I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Wow. You see the rest in that? Yeah. He's like, you gain the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. You don't gain it through obedience, being a good Christian. You gain it through the anointing of Jesus. Like you, you run into him and you hide yourself in him and he covers you with his anointing. He anoints you the way that only you can be anointed in Christ to be Josiah Jesus, you know? <laughs> like you, you, there's no one like you. Adrian Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so let all who are fully mature have the same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. I'm not yet gripped by these desires, but I want these desires to grip me. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like it's a safe place to meditate on this and, and, and ask God to help me grow in desiring this. Because it's, uh, to be honest, I, I think uh, I'm more apt to um, desire comfort, um, desire familiar things that I feel comfortable in, routines, patterns, things that I know and I'm aware, like, this is how this is gonna go. You know, this is how this is gonna go. I'm gonna have this much money for this, I'll be good, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's easier to, for me to just um, go back towards comfort than um, passion and zeal for, um, like knowing him yeah. and um, experiencing the fullness of what he has for us, for me here on the earth. Um, okay. And then Paul says this to like everybody. He's like, all right, let us all advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. My beloved friends, imitate my walk with God and follow all those who walk according to the way of life we model. I love that. The way of life. They're like constantly like giving themselves over to death and they're like letting go of their own like rights and he's calling that the way of life. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. For there are many who live by different standards. As I warned you many times, I weep as I write these words. They are enemies of the cross of the anointed one and doom awaits them. Their God has possessed them and made them mute. Uh, the other translation of that says you're, they, they, um, they boast in their, in their belly or something. Their, belly. their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. Yeah. Thank you. What I think he's saying there is he's talking about lust. He's saying, he's saying that, that everyone, that these people are led by lust. Mm -hmm. you, when you lust for something, where do you feel it? Mm -hmm. You feel it like all in here, you know? Their boast is in their shameful lifestyles and their minds are in the dirt. But we are a colony, a citizenship of heaven on earth. As we cling tightly to our life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, here, here's the crescendo. Okay, our life giver, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humility and transfigure us into the identical likeness of his glorified body. So what I want to slow down and, and point out right there is um, Jesus is talking to like the corporate body. He's saying, listen, like the body of your humility is what I use to transfigure you mm. into perfection, mm. into his glorified body. He's talking about like the natural man becoming the overcoming life. It comes through humility. When we collectively as the church put on the body of humility, he transforms us. He transfigures us. He, the life that he wants to give us can come in and, not, and then we can walk in resurrection life. 
This is how it happens. It happens through humility. Humility is the gateway. It's the pathway. It's the, the modus operandi for God to give life to death. The body of our humility, that is such a, an incredible thing. It's, it's the, um, in the Passion, it says, um, it says a little bit different, but under the, in the footnote, it says the body of our humility. And when I saw that, it blew my mind because I've been catching this understanding of humility for some time. And it's just growing bigger and bigger into my heart. But humility is the key to life. You know, it, it really is. Um, Proverbs 2, 22, 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, glory, and life. The passion version of that is, Laying your life down in tender surrender before the Lord will bring life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. Yeah. Laying your life down in tender surrender before the Lord will bring you life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. Humility always precedes honor. Um, you know, uh, Peter and James have an awesome blurb, each of them, on humility. Super powerful. Um, the, uh, the James one, uh, I'll read quickly just to remind you. Um, no, not the James one, the Peter one. Um, In every relationship, each one of you wrap around yourselves with the apron of a humble servant, because God resists you when you're proud, but he multiplies grace and favor when you're humble. If you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you and as you leave the timing in his hands. Yeah, that part. And then he makes it super practical, and he's like, pour out all your worries and stress on him and leave them there with him, for he always tenderly cares for you. What does that imply? It implies if you're carrying stresses and anxieties, that's pride. You're trying to do it alone, on your own, in your own strength and power. And he's saying the most practical way you can humble yourself is by casting your cares on his lap and saying, Lord, I, I don't know what to do about this. I'm just going to give this to you. Wow. And you offload those emotional burdens that are weighing you down. And it goes on, and it's awesome. That, that's a great place to what meditate. Was that? that was that First Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, um, like the first 10 verses. All right, to end this, I'm going to read um, I'm going to read something from the final quest. Who's read the, who's read the final quest here? One, two, three. Okay, awesome. This is such an awesome allegory. It, so Rick Joyner, I'm sure many of you have heard of him, but he had a, he had a series of visions and dreams years ago uh, about the end time church and the, the battle and stuff, and it's one of the most inspiring books I've ever read. Um, but the most profound part that I've read still up to this point was his was his yeah. description of humility and pride. Yeah. Um, so this this is going to be a few pages. So track with me. Raise your hand if I if I start getting monotone or something, or you're like you start like going somewhere else because this is powerful. Um, He's, a, he's in a spiritual place, like interacting with angels, um, demons, and he's seeing like a massive war going on, battle. Um, this section is called The Deadly Trap. <clears throat> I looked out over the carnage below and the slowly retreating demonic army. Behind me, more of the glorious warriors were constantly taking their places on the mountain. So he had, he had just recently had a massive victory, and he, he was wearing this armor, the armor of God, and he was shining. He was like, it was glorious. He, was, he said like his, his armor was so bright, it was blinding even him. He was like, you know, trying to see. Because it was so glorious, because he was wearing the armor of, of God, you know? Um, and he had this awesome victory. So um, he said, behind me, more of the glorious warriors were constantly taking their places on the mountain. I knew that we were now strong enough to attack and destroy what was left of this enemy horde. And he's walking with wisdom. And wisdom tells him, not yet. Look over there. I looked in the direction 
wisdom was pointing, but I had to shield my eyes from the glory emanating from my own armor to see anything. Then I caught a glimpse of some movement in a small valley. I could not make out what I was seeing because the glory shining from my armor made it difficult to see in the darkness. I asked wisdom if there was something that I could cover my armor with so I could see. He then gave me a very plain mantle to put on. What is this? I inquired, a little insulted by his drabness. <laughs> Humility, said wisdom. You will not be able to see very well without it. Reluctantly, I put it on. And immediately, I saw many things that I could not see before. Keep in mind, this is after a major victory with the Lord that this is happening. That's the context. I looked toward the valley and the movement that I had seen. To my astonishment, there was an entire division of the enemy horde that was waiting to ambush anyone who ventured from the mountain. What army is that, I asked? And how did they escape the battle intact? That is pride, explained Wisdom. It is the hardest enemy to see after you've been in the glory. Wow. Those who refuse to put on this cloak will suffer much at the hands of that most devious enemy. Wow. As I looked back at the mountain, I saw many of the glorious warriors crossing the plains to attack the remnant of the army horde, or the enemy horde. None of them were wearing the cloaks of humility, and they had not seen the enemy that was ready to attack them from their rear. I started to run out to stop them, but wisdom restrained me. You cannot stop this, he said. Only the soldiers who wear this cloak will recognize your authority. Wow. Come with me. There's something else you must see before you can help lead in the great battle that is to come. The foundation of glory. Wisdom led me down the mountain to the very lowest level, which was named salvation. You see this as the lowest level, declared wisdom, but this is the foundation of the entire mountain. In any journey, the first step is the most important, and it is usually the most difficult. Without salvation, there would be no mountain. I was appalled by the carnage on this level. Every soldier was badly wounded, but none of them were dead. Multitudes were barely clinging to the edge. Many seemed ready to fall off, but none did. Angels were everywhere, ministering to the soldiers with such great joy that I had to ask, why are they so happy? These angels have beheld the courage that it took for these to hold on. They may not have gone any further, but neither did they give up. They will soon be healed. Then they, be, then they will behold the glory of the rest of the mountain, and they will begin to climb. These will be great warriors for the battle to come. But wouldn't they have been better off to climb the mountain with the rest of us? I protested, seeing their present condition. It would have been better for them, but not for you. By staying here, they kept most of your enemies occupied, and that made it easier for you to climb. Very few from the higher levels ever reached out to help others come to the mountain, but these did. Even when barely clinging to the mountain themselves, they would reach out to pull others up. In fact, most of the mighty warriors were led to the mountain by these faithful ones. Those who stayed and faithfully fought on the level of salvation are no less heroes than the ones who made it to the top. They brought great joy to heaven by leading others to salvation. It was for this reason that all the angels in heaven wanted to come and minister to them, but only the most honored were permitted. Again, I felt shame for my previous attitude toward these great saints. Many of us had scorned them as we climbed to the higher levels. They had made many mistakes during the battle, but they had also displayed more of the shepherd's heart than the rest of us. The Lord would leave the 99 to go after the one who was lost. These had stayed in the place where they could still reach the lost, and they paid a dear price for it too. I wanted to help, but I did not know where to start. Wisdom then said to me, it is right for you to want to help, but you will help most by going on to what you've been called to do. These will all be healed and will climb the mountain. They can now climb faster because of you and the others who went before them, both destroying the enemy and marking the way. They will join you again in the battle. These are fearless ones who will never retreat before the enemy. You guys still with me? Yeah. yeah. Last part, the power of pride. I was pondering how I was learning as much by descending the mountain as I had by climbing it. When the noise from the battlefield drew my attention, by now thousands of the mighty warriors had crossed the plain to attack the remnant of the enemy horde. The enemy was fleeing in all directions except for one division, pride. Completely undetected, it marched right up to the rear of the advancing warriors and was about to release a hail of arrows. 
I then noticed that the mighty warriors had no armor on their backsides. They were totally exposed and vulnerable to what was about to hit them. Wisdom remarked, you've taught that there is no armor for the backside, which means you're vulnerable if you run from the enemy. However, you never saw how advancing in pride also makes you vulnerable. I could only nod in acknowledgement, for it was too late to do anything. It was almost unbearable to watch, but wisdom said that I must. I knew the kingdom of God was about to suffer a major defeat. Though I had felt sorrow before, I had never felt this kind of sorrow. To my amazement, when the arrows of pride struck the warriors, they did not even notice. Isn't that crazy? However, the enemy kept shooting. The warriors, were, the warriors were bleeding and getting weaker fast, but they would not acknowledge it. Soon they were too weak to hold up their shields and swords. They cast them down, declaring that they no longer needed them. They started taking off their armor, saying it was not needed anymore either. Then another enemy division appeared and moved up swiftly. It was called Strong Delusion. Its members released a hail of arrows, and they all seemed to hit their marks. It only took a few of the demons of delusion, who were all small and seemingly weak, to lead away this once great army of glorious warriors. They were taken to various prison camps, each named after a different doctrine of demons. I was astounded at how this great company of the righteous had been so easily defeated, and they still did not even know what had hit them. I blurted out, how could those who were so strong, who had been all the way to the top of the mountain, who have have seen the Lord as they have, been so vulnerable? Pride is the hardest enemy to see, and it always sneaks up behind you, wisdom lamented. In some ways, those who have been to the greatest heights are in the greatest danger of falling. You must always remember that in this life, you can fall at any time from any level. Take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. I replied, which is uh, 1 Corinthians. How awesome such scriptures seem to me now, I said. When you think you are the least vulnerable to falling is in fact when you are actually the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Most men fall immediately after a great victory. Mm -hmm. Man, I I don't know about you guys, but like, you ever have an an incredible spiritual high day, Mm -hmm. and then the very next day you have like a horrible low? (laughs) pretty sure that's what he's getting at we it's just easy it's easy to fall into pride super easy we've got to learn to defeat this you know most men fall immediately after a great victory was the wisdom lamented how can we keep from being attacked like this i asked stay close to me wisdom (laughs) inquire of the lord before making major decisions and keep that mantle on what mantle humility humility then the enemy will not be able to easily blindside you as he did them. I looked at my mantle. It looked so plain and insignificant. I felt that it made me look more like a homeless person than a warrior. <laughs> Wisdom responded as if I'd been speaking out loud. The Lord is closer to the homeless than to kings. You only have true strength to the degree that you walk in grace, the grace of God. He gives his grace to the humble. No evil weapon can penetrate this mantle because nothing can overpower his grace. As long as you wear this mantle of humility, you are safe from this kind of attack. I then started to look up to see how many warriors were still on the mountain, and I was shocked to see how few there were. I noticed, however, that they all had on the same mantle of humility. How did that happen, I inquired. When they saw that the battle you just witnessed, or when they saw the battle you just witnessed, they all came to me for help. Mm. And I gave them their mantles. Wisdom replied, but I thought you were with me that whole time. I am with all who go forth to do the will of my father. Wisdom answered, you're the Lord, I cried. Yes, he answered. (laughs) I told you that I would never leave you or forsake you. I am with all my warriors, just as I'm with you. I will be to you whatever you need me need to accomplish my will and you have needed wisdom then he vanished <sighs> can you guys handle one more yeah yeah okay. last part i was left standing in the midst of a great company of angels who were ministering to the wounded on the level of salvation and as i began to walk past these angels they bowed on one knee and showed me great respect i finally asked one of them why they did this as even the smallest was much more powerful than i was because of the mantle, he replied. 
That is the highest rank in the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a plain mantle, I protested. No, the angel insisted. You are clothed in the grace of God. There is no greater power than that. But there are thousands of us all wearing the same mantle. How could it represent rank, I asked. You are the dreaded champions, the sons and daughters of the king. He wore the same mantle when he walked on this earth. As long as you are clothed in that, there is no power in heaven or on earth that can stand before you. Everyone in heaven and hell recognizes that mantle. We are indeed his servants, but he abides in you, and you are clothed in his grace. <laughs> Somehow I knew that if I had not been wearing the mantle, and if my glorious armor had been exposed, the angel's statements and behavior toward me would have fed my pride. It was simply impossible to feel prideful or arrogant while wearing such a drab, plain cloak. Wow. However, my confidence in the mantle is growing very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So good. Man. Oh, Jesus, we want, we want to put this mantle on, and we don't ever want to take it off. Um, we thank you for your armor, your glorious armor, all of its goodness. And we want to we want to walk in that. We want to operate in all the armor, Lord, the, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of gospel of peace, all those. They are glorious. But, Lord, we want on top of that the garment of humility yeah. so that we can see clearly, so that we can hear clearly. Wisdom, we ask you to teach us. Yeah. We inquire of you the ways in which we need to go. Each one of us, we thank you that you have specific wisdom for each one of us, each day and each night. We honor you, wisdom. We, we need you, we honor you, and we thank you for your goodness. You are Lord. We acknowledge you as Lord. May we become experts at putting on and keeping on the garment of humility, and may we not become offended with its plainness. May we not give in to the temptations of pride any longer to look good or to look glorious or to just uncover ourselves and, and show off. Jesus, I know there's moments you want to show your glory and we say yes to those. Teach us how to steward those moments of glory um, with fear and trembling <laughs> so that we wouldn't be deceived by pride. We don't want to be fearful either, Lord, of being deceived by pride. We thank you that your ability to keep yeah. us is so much more powerful yeah. than the enemy's ability to deceive us. Yeah. And so we acknowledge that right now as a group and as your body, mm -hmm. that we are more confident in your ability to keep us yeah. than in our weaknesses and in abilities to, to be deceived. Yeah. Um, and so collectively right now, Lord, we say yes and amen to humility covering us, covering Kairos, covering each one of us individually as we walk out tonight. Um, and then... And then you're showing us the way, the path of, of Jesus, what it means to walk like him and be like him as, as we find ourselves in him as one. You and us, Lord, and us in you. Yeah. We love you because you first loved us. We're so grateful. Ah, in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes. Can I share a story? Yeah. Let's do a communion also.